I didn't have especially high expectations for Elix when it first launched in 2017. Despite my fondness for Piranha Bytes games, they'd made some questionable decisions in the last several years, and their last few games weren't all that fun or memorable to me. So it was kind of surprising to me when I actually really enjoyed Elix, with it quickly entering consideration as being among my favorite open-world action-adventure RPGs of all time, and especially of recent years. That game was far from perfect, however, as it had a lot of unpolished elements and some poorly thought-out ideas that left the game feeling objectively lacking in certain areas that had been done better in previous Piranha Bytes games, and by other games in general in some cases. Despite those issues, it still had some really compelling things going for it, like the intriguing blend of fantasy, science fiction, and post-apocalypse themes, the intriguing backstory and world-building, the fun world design, the rewarding exploration, the engaging quest design, the satisfying progression system, and some solid RPG mechanics, all of which made the overall experience better than the sum of its parts for anyone who could look past the superficial issues and appreciate the unique soul and ambition that Elix One had to offer. With Elix 2, my simple hope was that they'd keep the things that worked well in the first game, fix the things that didn't work well, and then add some new tweaks on top of everything to keep the experience fresh and exciting. The idea being that the sequel would simply be a better version of a game I already enjoyed. That seems to have been Piranha Bytes' goal as well, as a gameplay formula in the sequel remains virtually identical to the first game, with a lot of critical improvements to core gameplay mechanics that turned many people off from the first game originally, and with some really fun new additions mixed in as well. Unfortunately, it's not a uniform improvement all across the board. In fact, some things actually feel a little worse than they did in the first game, which is somewhat baffling and certainly disappointing considering the opportunity that such a sequel presents to deliver the same type of gameplay experience in an overall better package. I'll talk about the various pros and cons for Elix 2 in more detail in my full review, so note that this is not meant to be a comprehensive critique or evaluation, and I'm not trying to bash Elix 2 or say that it's a worse game than the first one or anything like that. For this video, I just wanted to share some more casual thoughts and observations about some of the smaller, more specific things that I liked in Elix 1 which didn't make their way into the sequel, or whose effects were lessened in the sequel. I won't be spoiling any content from either game, so feel free to continue on whether you've played these games or not. Number 1. The Cold Meter In Elix 1, the cold meter represented Jax's emotional state, with his coldness decreasing as you picked more emotional responses and quest solutions in dialogue, and his coldness increasing as you picked more logical, rational options. What I liked about the cold meter in Elix 1 is that it wasn't a typical karma meter like other RPGs tend to employ. It wasn't about picking morally good or bad decisions, since there was actually quite a bit of overlap between the two dichotomous elements. An emotional response could mean showing compassion for someone who's suffering, a morally good option, but it could also mean getting pissed off at someone and threatening to kill them, a morally bad option. Likewise, cold options aren't necessarily bad or evil choices. In fact, they're sometimes smart and practical choices that might do the most good in a given situation, like focusing on the matter at hand instead of getting offended and seeking petty revenge, or making the correct tactical decision to commit forces who might get killed defending an objective of utmost importance. In Elix 2, the cold meter has been replaced by a destruction meter, which measures Jax's creative or destructive tendencies. Since Jax is now long removed from his days as a former ALB, and since most players chose to be either warm or neutral in the first game, it makes some sense to move on from the cold meter and do something a little different. Unfortunately, the new destruction meter doesn't seem to have as much nuance or complexity as the first game's cold meter. In contrast to the cold meter, the destruction meter feels more like a true karma meter where every action is either good or bad. Or put another way, nice or mean. I'm sure it's supposed to represent something else, but that's how it ends up feeling to me in practice. As a result, I don't find any of the role-playing decisions as interesting because it makes every situation into a straightforward choice with clear telegraphing of this is the creative option, which is always on top, and this is the destructive option, which is always on the bottom, with the same types of predictable outcomes to be expected from picking those options. Number 2. Skill Checks in Dialogue by this, I specifically mean skill checks, not attribute checks. Both games allow you to use your stats to influence conversations by picking specific choices if your character meets the minimum requirements. However, Elix 2 does this through your attributes, whereas Elix 1 did this with your cumulative skill points in certain fields. If, say, you'd spent 4 skill points on crafting skills, then your total crafting skill would be level 4, and you could pass a crafting skill check and dialogue up to a level 4 difficulty. 
I liked this system because even though the vast majority of the game's skills were combat related or pertain to other gameplay mechanisms besides dialogue, it helped to translate your character's practical, mechanical experience into more conceptual understanding. For instance, I thought it was interesting that your character would know how to help someone identify a certain type of plant because of your survival experience or that your character could spot an ambush because of your combat experience. Granted, some of this is just semantics, since you could achieve the same outcome with an intelligence check or a cunning check, respectively, but to me, the skill checks just felt more personal and directly correlated to your character's unique experience and expertise, as compared to checking against your simple attributes. I certainly can't object to having attribute checks in Elix 2, but this is a case where I feel like they could have kept the skill checks as well, thus making the roleplaying more robust in general, as opposed to streamlining it into what feels like a more straightforward system. Number 3. Combo System and Special Attacks Elix 1's combat system was based around the combo meter, with you gaining progress towards executing extra powerful special attacks with each successful attack, and losing progress if you went too long between attacks or mistimed your actions. The system wasn't perfect, since it kind of encouraged you to just repetitively execute the same pattern for every fight over and over again, but it felt like there was more of a reward in Elix 1 for stringing multiple attacks together and more consequences for timing your actions appropriately and balancing offense and defense successfully. In Elix 2, the combo system has been removed entirely in favor of a more freeform system with more total types of attack animations that you can execute from different states of action. This, in conjunction with more fluid transitionary animations, helps to make the combat system feel more fluid and less rigid than it did in the first game. But the combo system added a whole extra layer of depth to the experience that's just completely missing in Elix 2. I understand the desire to rework the core melee combat mechanics, but this is a case where it seems like the goal should have been to expand and improve on the existing system as opposed to scrapping it all together. I'd say the melee combat generally feels better in Elix 2, but I still miss the combo meter and wish it could have been re-implemented as some kind of active skill the player could learn from a trainer. Number 4. Weapon and Ammo Variety Elix 1 had a lot of different weapon types in its arsenal, each of which functioned differently from the others. Melee weapons, for instance, had six completely different sets of attack animations and specials depending on whether you were using a one-handed sword, club, or axe, or a two-handed sword, club, or axe, and lots of ranged weaponry had different types of ammunition and firing modes. Granted, there were a lot of balance issues with Elix 1's weaponry, with certain ammunition types or firing modes being rendered obsolete by straight up more powerful, more effective options, and certain melee weapons were likewise outclassed by arguably better weapon types, but it still gave you a lot of options for finding a unique type of loadout or playstyle if you really wanted to. In Elix 2, the options have been streamlined to such a degree that the amount of choice is almost non-existent. All one-handed weapons have the exact same animations, and there are only two types of two-handed movesets. Ranged weapons likewise have had their ammunition types and firing modes reduced to only one. With laser rifles, for example, you no longer have the choice of going single fire, three round burst, or full auto, as you're now forcibly restricted to single shot mode. I can only assume this was done for balancing purposes, as it's presumably easier to balance, say, 6 variables instead of 18, but I still miss the sheer variety that was present in Elix 1 and wish Elix 2 could have retained some more of that variety. Number 5. Special Plants Like Golden Whispers or King Sorrels in Elix 1, you would sometimes find rare, special plants out in the wild like Golden Whispers and King Sorrels, which could be used with the chemistry skill to brew permanent stat potions. These were a nice little feature that gave you those little extra rewards to discover during exploration, but unfortunately, special plants have been completely removed in Elix 2. I guess I shouldn't say removed, because you can still find special plants, except they no longer serve any function whatsoever, despite what their descriptions might imply, as there are no recipes that use some of these so-called special plants. Instead, you craft permanent stat potions by using different types of troll hearts. I like the return of brewing individual stat potions from previous Piranha Bytes games, but I just wish it didn't have to come at the expense of the plant foraging, because that's just one less rewarding thing to discover when you're out exploring the world, and it makes picking up plants feel kind of pointless in this game. Number 6. Finding Things on Rooftops and High Altitudes To be clear, you can still find things on rooftops and high altitudes in Elix 2. I just feel like there was a lot more of that in Elix 1. 
In the original game, it felt like any time you thought to check on top of a structure somewhere, no matter how implausible it might seem, you'd find some kind of reward, even if it was just a small bag of Alexit. In Elix 2, it seemed like the vast majority of the time that I jetpacked on top of a building or odd-looking structure, I was rewarded with absolutely nothing at all. After a while, it discouraged me from even checking on top of buildings anymore, because it felt like a safe bet that I wouldn't find anything worthwhile. This is a really strange downgrade as far as I'm concerned, because the verticality was one of Elix's strongest assets and it would seem all too easy to keep up the same type of design in the sequel, especially with so many new jetpack abilities that seem to put even more emphasis on the jetpack. Number 7. Crazy Off-The-Wall Easter Eggs Elix 2 has some amusing things to discover in the world if you explore thoroughly enough, usually dealing with skeletons positioned in comical ways to imply things that they may have been doing when they died, in addition to other odd references to things. These are fun things to include in the game, of course, but for the most part the easter eggs in Elix 2 feel plausibly grounded in reality, like the circumstances could happen even if it were highly unlikely. That could be a good thing if you value immersive plausibility in your humorous easter eggs, but I never seem to run into anything as crazy as some of the stuff I'd encounter in Elix 1, which is the kind of stuff I enjoy with these things. Stuff like the giant skeletal arm sticking out of the mountains of Zaycor, the snowboarding skelly frozen in mid-air, the skeleton family waiting to be abducted by alien UFOs, and so on were just so off the wall and bizarre that I found them especially entertaining for the simple fact that they seemed to break the game's intended lore and logic and were placed well enough out of the way that you'd only discover them if you really searched off the beaten path. Maybe there are similarly zany easter eggs in Elix 2 and I just didn't find them, but I certainly looked and wish I could have found some more like the ones in the first game. Number 8. Those Weird Glowing Plant Orbs Elix takes place on a planet with an Earth-like environment, which has obviously been affected by the comet's impact and the newfound introduction of Elix into the ecosystem, but the first game had little touches here and there to make it feel like it could be an actual alien planet, or at least something that's been modified beyond our own mundane world. Those weird glowing plant orbs in the starting area of Edan are some of the most noteworthy examples, and there's nothing in Elix 2 that comes close to replicating the exotic quality those things brought to the first game's setting. In Elix 2, everything looks like pretty boring, normal-looking Earth-like environments, which combined with a somewhat drab color palette and repetitive graphical assets makes the world less visually interesting to look at. Number 9. Environmental Hazards The first game used environmental hazards like poison, radiation, fire, and frost to lend each biome of the game some type of unique obstacle to deal with during exploration, while also restricting more valuable rewards by placing them inside innately deadly areas that would kill you just by being in them too long. It added some extra character to the game for the desert wasteland of Tavar to have lots of irradiated areas reminiscent of a nuclear apocalypse, which was the theme they were obviously going for in that area, and likewise navigating some of the poisonous swamps in Adan and the Forbidden Valley added an extra layer of challenge to getting around the world and discovering everything there was to discover. So, they served an actual mechanical purpose in the gameplay design. They weren't just a substitute for invisible walls to define the playable areas of the game like they seem to be in Elix 2. Elix 2 still has these types of status effects, and even gives you passive skills and consumable items to mitigate these effects, but it's rare for the environmental hazards to serve any role in the actual game. I can only recall a sparse few instances when a hazard actually mattered for a quest or a unique bit of exploration. So besides making those skills and items relatively useless, I feel like it also cuts back on some of the depth, variety, and complication in exploration, when you basically never have to worry about these types of areas in the game anymore. Number 10. A Place Like the Domed City The Domed City in Elix 1 was a combined hub where all four of the game's factions lived and worked together, including separatist members of the antagonist faction. That was a fun concept, because factions in Piranha Bytes games are typically pretty isolated from one another, with little direct interaction outside of highly scripted main quest events. With all of Elix's factions having wildly diverse ideologies and ambitions, it was nice to see those differing viewpoints contrasted against one another more directly, with more direct conflicts of interest as the different factions vied for you to complete quests in ways that would benefit their particular faction over another. Besides that, it also helps to paint a more realistic picture of society by showing some actual attempts at cooperation, and so I liked having that glimpse into how all these different groups might actually live together. 
The Dome City itself doesn't make an appearance in Elix 2, but there's no comparable location in the sequel, as the game's five factions remain completely separate from one another. I wouldn't want for them to simply rehash the same scenario as the Domed City all over again, because we've already seen that, but I still would have liked to see a similar type of communal hub where all of the game's factions are represented, like, say, an embassy where the factions send representatives to negotiate with the other factions, or some kind of large-scale market town where they trade and do business with one another for unique goods and materials they can't get in their own territories. That's maybe not feasible with certain factions like the Morcons, whose whole thing is that they're isolationist xenophobes who are just now emerging from the underground subway systems for the first time since the Comet, but you can still make it work. Like, maybe they're not represented there initially, and you're sent as an ambassador to recruit an attaché, or maybe it's only reformed Morcons living there who don't support the violent aspects of the Morcons' dogmas. And even if the whole point of the main story is that Jax failed to unite the factions to work together against the oncoming threat that was presented at the end of the first game, that doesn't mean they can't still work together in some capacity to deal with more worldly, practical concerns in the meantime. Maybe the fate of the domed city proved that the factions can't all live and work together in the first place. But it's been several years and they already joined forces to defeat the bad guy in the first game, so it seems feasible to me for there to have been some kind of progressive evolution of their ideologies to support some more symbiotic relationships, if only in limited capacities. After all, each of the returning factions had their more extreme characteristics toned down in the sequel, so it seems like they should be less diametrically opposed to one another, thus allowing for some more civil engagement with one another. A lot has changed between games, and I feel as though a domed city-esque location would have been a fun way to show how the faction relationships have changed and evolved in a more hands-on experience, as opposed to merely telling us about it through dialogue. Number 11. Inventory Tabs and the Adjutor Implant This is such a simple thing, but I miss having tabs in the old inventory in Elix 1, which allowed you to quickly switch to specific subsections with a single click. Although the sequel still sorts items into different categories, there's no quick way to navigate to a specific category as the whole thing is organized in one giant list that you have to scroll all the way up and down to find what you want every single time you need to find a particular item. The unique iconography and inclusion of horizontal rows are both welcome improvements to the original inventory system, but the complete lack of category navigation is just baffling to me. Like, why couldn't they have put tabs along the top or side of the inventory window? And while on the subject of the interface, I'll go on to say that I miss how it used to be represented as a holographic projection from an implant in Jax's arm. That was a fun little thing that gave the original game a little bit of extra personality and helps with the immersion just a tiny bit. The new interface looks kind of generic in contrast, and it's weird having one third of the interface used by my character uselessly staring back at me. Number 12, the 10 key hot bar. When it comes to quick-use item slotting, the two standard options are to use a hot bar at the bottom of the screen with items assigned to any of the ten numerical keys on the keyboard, or a quick wheel or dial that you can bring up to select items from there with a joystick or cursor. The benefit of the quick wheel, which Elix 2 uses, is that it can be used by both console and PC users. You can even assign items on the wheel to numerical values and treat it exactly like a typical PC-style hot bar. The problem I have with this is that the wheel in Elix 2 only has 8 slots on it, whereas the bar in Elix 1 had 10 slots. With the way I play these games, I typically end up with multiple types of weapons, healing items, and active abilities equipped which quickly take up limited room in those quick use item slots. And so having only 8 to work with in Elix 2 is another straight downgrade compared to Elix 1 as far as I'm concerned. Number 13. Nasty. Nasty was always my preferred romance option in the first game, because she was just such a bundle of joy to be around. What the fuck do you want? Who are you? Fuck off! She also had a lot of insightful commentary to provide during dialogue, which was uniquely wholesome and uplifting. This guy needs to get laid or jerk off. What did you say? I said it sounds like you need time off. I'm being facetious, of course, but her brusque mannerisms in the first game gave her this air of a no-nonsense, spunky rebel, which was oftentimes amusing and felt like it was in good spirits most of the time, even if she was being brazenly offensive about it, like there was a subtle trace of sarcasm to some of her behavior. Everything okay with us? Butterflies and honey. Stop being so soppy and let's get the job done, you asswipe. And as you advanced her personal quest, you learned a little more about why she acts that way, which added some extra plausibility and depth to her abrasive personality. 
She wasn't meant to be an innately likable character, but she became sympathetic over the course of the game, and I at least enjoyed her banter and watching everyone else react to her. Nasty makes a return in Elix 2, so she's not technically gone, but she feels like a different character this time around. So when I say I miss Nasty, I mean I miss the way she used to be portrayed. For starters, her voice actor is completely different and isn't even trying to mimic the sound of her original voice. Still wasting your life in that shithole? What are you doing here anyway? Thought you were with the outlaws. Used to be. I'm done with those assholes. Berserkers are in charge of the fort now, to hell with that. Then there's Baxter up at the crater. Fucker wanted me to work my way up from the bottom. You believe that? My own people. So hearing that gravelly voice is a jarring change right from the get-go, and I find it a really strange choice for her to join the Morcon faction. The game treats her as the only destructive companion, so it makes sense for her to join the Morcons given their destructive nature, but I thought that whole self-destructive attitude was kind of resolved by the end of her personal quest in the first game, like she went through a period of growth and change as a character, so why is she back to being a full-on destructive a-hole? I guess it's because of off-screen drama between her, Jax, and Kaya, with Pranabites forcing a canonical relationship with Kaya on the player, which is something that I was never partial to and comes off as yet another jarring change that seemingly didn't have to happen. But really, her combative, caustic personality this time around doesn't feel as fun or spunky as it used to. It now feels like she's just being mean and, well, nasty for no justifiable reason, really. I liked Nasty a lot in the first game, but I found her virtually unlikable in the sequel. And that's about all I have for this video. I'm sure there's more I could bring up, but these are the ones that immediately came to mind, and like I said, I wanted to keep this one somewhat short and a little more casual. I'll probably make further comparisons in my full review, but wanted to get a little something out there in the meantime. If you've played both games, then I'd be interested to hear if there are other things you missed from the first game that didn't really play out in the sequel, so let me know in the comments where you agree or disagree, or if there's anything else you'd like to add.